Your dad's missing you so much, Shannon. He's even out looking for you. Please come home, Shannon. If you're out there, come home. If anybody's got my daughter, my beautiful princess daughter, please bring her home safe. Police emergency. Hiya, I want the cotton daughter is missing, please. Right, I want to When Karen Matthews rang the local emergency services in February 2008, the world seemed to come together to help her. A mother losing her daughter is one of the most heartbreaking experiences imaginable. But no one suspected Karen was a narcissistic mother monster, forcing her daughter into a scenario that would get her fame and money. The way nine-year-old Shannon was found one month later would shock everyone following the case. No one could believe a mother could be so callous, using her daughter as an object and scarring her for life. Let's learn the tragic story of Shannon Matthews and the dark history of her family. On February 19th, 2008, a worried mom with a trembling voice rang 999 in Dewsbury, England. Police emergency. Hi, I want the cotton daughter is missing, please. Right, how old is she? Nine. Nine? Yeah. When did you last see her? She went to school this morning. The dispatcher was quick to rule out a runaway scenario. Even though Shannon was very young, some kids do run away from home after bad fights with their parents. Right, have there been any arguments or anything? No. Not at all. No. Have, have you been in touch with any of her friends or anybody I've like that? everywhere I can think of her friends, wives and family and everything. Then there was another possible scenario. If she walked to and from school by herself every day, then someone could have taken her. No. Does she go to school and come back on her own normally then? Yes. Right. So you expected her own what at 4 o'clock? About, about half a seat later she's come right. back and trust me, she's still at 3. Does she have a mobile phone or anything like that? No, just, uh, just right, so she, there's no way of actually ringing to find out. This was not strange, especially in 2008 when there were hardly any smartphones easily available, and kids used to get mobile phones later on. Karen once again assured the dispatcher that she had already tried looking for Shannon at her friends' and neighbors' homes. You've been in touch with all the relatives, yeah. and there's nowhere else that you've got left to look. No. Have you been in touch with the school, and uh, can they confirm whether she went to school at normal time at 10 past 3? Karen's voice started trembling harder when she confronted the reality of her daughter missing. Has she been missing before? No, first time. And this was the expected reaction from the mother of a young daughter in danger. The detectives in Dewsbury immediately started Shannon's case, all too aware that every second counts in kidnapping cases. One of the first places they searched was of course Shannon's school. Before long, they checked its surveillance footage and confirmed what Karen had said. Shannon was last seen leaving the school at 3.10 p.m. A huge team was assigned to the case, knocking on every single door in Dewsbury and asking for any sightings that could point them in Shannon's direction. Over 200 officers were drafted, some even from outside Dewsbury. Hundreds of more volunteers offered to join the search for Shannon, aware that the more they stalled, the smaller the odds would be that she was found alive. Authorities searched the forests and every natural area in Yorkshire, and divers looked through lakes and rivers for remains. Every single day, Shannon would appear on live TV, pleading for her daughter to come home. Your dad's missing you so much, Shannon. He's even out looking for you. Please come home, Shannon. If you're out there, come home. If anybody's got my daughter, my beautiful princess daughter, please bring her home safe. She seemed in shambles, but when the detectives asked her where her daughter could be, Karen insisted she must be with one of her close friends or neighbors. Then why didn't she or the detectives find her there? They'd searched every home in Dewsbury thoroughly. Why wasn't Karen concerned with the worst case scenario? Most mothers would fear the worst after their young daughters were missing for weeks. Eventually, finding Shannon did not require a huge task force, canines or divers, but a thorough look at her family history. Shannon was born on September 9, 1998 to Karen Matthews and Leon Rose. She was just a toddler when her parents broke up and Shannon stayed with her mother, keeping her family name. Reportedly, Leon was not a very present father. Everyone who knew Shannon described her as shy, independent, and who preferred to be on her own than with her mother. Karen had seven children with five different men. Five of the seven children lived with Karen and her then-boyfriend, Craig Meehan. 
Craig was 22 years old, a full decade Karen's junior. They all lived in a low-income house in Dewsbury, West Yorkshire. Karen received around 400 pounds a week in benefits to support herself and her family. She was unemployed and was struggling to care for five children. Ironically, Karen earned more from benefits by staying at home than she would by working a minimum wage full-time job. Of course, it made more sense for her to stay home and raise the kids than be gone for eight or more hours every day. But here's the thing. Karen was not a dedicated full-time mom. In fact, she often got herself into such toxic relationships that their fights could be heard across the street. In one incident, the detectives found out that Karen was violently fighting her ex-boyfriend when her neighbors took little Shannon away. They told Karen that they would only give Shannon back when the turmoil in their home died out. They are worried for Shannon's well-being. A young child should not be exposed to this level of aggression. When the neighbors took Shannon in, they realized that she needed to have a bath. To their shock, her head was covered in lice, and she hadn't changed her clothes in a long time. Shannon was also disturbingly skittish. She would flinch at the slightest sudden movement or unexpected touch. Honestly, what sort of home did she grow up in? As they should, the neighbors ended up calling Child Protection Services and reported everything they noted that day. The horrific fight, Shannon's unhygienic state, and her fight or flight state. Heartbreakingly, CPS did nothing to rescue Shannon or her siblings from that house of horrors. When investigators spoke to the neighbors, they offered a grim opinion on Karen's children. They weren't the love of her life, but a means to an end. You see, at the time in the UK, the more children you had, the more benefits you received from the state if you were unemployed. So Karen didn't have children because she loved them, and she did not care for them properly after having them. Instead, she was just stacking them up for cash. This sounds horrible, but Karen's neighbors were not the only witnesses sharing this opinion about Karen. The horrific state of neglect her kids were found in only goes to confirm it. When Karen started dating Craig and he moved into her home, people thought this was a better relationship for Karen and her children. Craig seemed like a good person, kinder, and less aggressive than Karen's exes. In fact, Craig was the one who reportedly notified Karen that her daughter was missing. She hadn't returned home from school at 3.30 that day, and he asked his girlfriend if she knew where she was. Karen looked at Craig worriedly and phoned her school. They confirmed that she had left at 10 past 3. That afternoon, Karen also visited her neighbors, just like she had told the dispatcher. But no matter how many people she had asked about her little daughter, no one had a clue where she could be. And authorities didn't either, for almost a month. But the more authorities looked into Shannon's case, the more they suspected Karen. For starters, they discovered that she phoned authorities at around 7 p.m., over three hours after she learned her daughter was missing. People in Dewsbury were out looking for Shannon before her mother rang 999. In small communities, it's normal for people to rally up and help their neighbors. There were also two family liaisons assigned by authorities to talk to the family. You see, in missing children's cases, their families tend to be in such bad mental state that they need expert officers talking to them and reassuring them every step of the way. But the two liaisons noted something odd. While everyone else was frantic and desperate to find the nine-year-old girl, Karen was the calmest of them all. Sure, her voice trembled when she appeared on TV, and she pleaded for her daughter to come home. But when the cameras were away, she said she was sure her daughter would come back. She must have run away and hidden at a friend's house, right? What's more, most families have one family liaison, not two. The second one was assigned to Karen's case after the first liaison, Alex Grummet, said he was suspicious of Karen. The second officer came for a second opinion, but DC Christine Freeman had the same opinion as Alex. There was something off about Karen and her boyfriend. The first time she entered the couple's messy home, she saw Craig playing a video game on his Xbox in a relaxed position on his sofa. And when Christine's phone rang, Karen said, oh, I love this tune. Christine noted simply any mother worried about her missing daughter would ask what the phone call was about, not make silly remarks about the ringtone. Indeed, Karen's case became a media circus. Awful things like this rarely happen in West Yorkshire or other quiet communities in the UK. So journalists poured in from all neighboring areas and lots of cameras were set outside Karen's dear illicit house. 
Sometimes Karen would enjoy the spotlight, appearing distraught and pleading some more with the cameras outdoors. Other times she would complain about the hyena-like journalists to the two family liaisons inside her home. She was also accusing detectives of not doing enough for her little girl. Christine tried staying objective, wondering if perhaps the shock had gotten to Karen. But the more Christine tried to see the good in Karen, the more she did to make her doubt she ever had good intentions. She was making distasteful jokes, chilling with her boyfriend, and complaining about authorities or journalists. Meanwhile, millions were spent on the huge task force. People set up funds to get a reward together for authorities, and hundreds of people stopped allowing their children to walk to school by themselves. Karen couldn't see the chaos she was causing, and she kept complaining about her disrupted life, all the while keeping her nine-year-old daughter drugged and tied to a bed. About a week into Shannon's disappearance, her mom Karen was invited to an official police interview. She was told this was standard procedure, they just needed to go over the timeline one more time. But this was not the reality. By now, the detectives had reasons to consider Karen a prime suspect in the kidnapping, or even murder, of Shannon. Throughout her interrogation, Shannon was emotional, frequently stopping her answers to cry a little. She told detectives the same conflicting story. On the one hand, she checked all her neighbors and Shannon's friends' homes on the day of her disappearance. On the other hand, she was sure her daughter must be with one of her friends or neighbors, so which one was it? The detectives also interviewed Shannon's father, Leon. Now, Leon said something interesting. Reportedly, Shannon was deeply unhappy with her mother, and she would repeatedly ask Leon if she could move in with him. Right next to Shannon's bunk bed, authorities found the following words carved into the wall. I want to live with my dad. Karen didn't want her children, her life, or that house. And she made it all too clear to her children. They felt unloved and unwanted and frequently witnessed horrific incidents of DV. Karen also had a habit of drinking quite a lot. In a questionable incident while Shannon was missing, a local grocery store offered Karen and Craig a voucher for a full cart of groceries. The couple went to the store and filled a cart with food and another one with alcohol to the brim. As if the family liaisons didn't already have enough doubts about these two. Leon also told detectives that he was certain Shannon wouldn't run away from home. Not on her own. She was unhappy at home and she feared her mother, but she was not the kind of kid to take her life into her own hands like that. Meanwhile, her mom would tell a neighbor, Shannon is out there in a nice warm environment, safe and sound. At the end of February, detectives spoke to Shannon's best friend at school, nine-year-old Megan Aldridge. She said she'd seen Shannon get bullied at school shortly before her disappearance. Megan stood up for her, but she could see Shannon was hurt. On top of it all, Megan knew Shannon was getting bullied and abused at home, so that incident was too much for her. According to Megan, Shannon had a little foxhole in a wooded area next to a rail line, where she liked to go and hide from everyone else when she felt unsafe. Megan took authorities to this spot to no avail. However, authorities now knew from two sources that Shannon was deeply unhappy at home. Karen was lying, and the more time passed and she remained calm, the more people turned against her, even her own family. On March 13th, one of those family members rang authorities with a new name, Michael Donovan. Michael was Craig's uncle and lived less than a mile from their house. Michael was also the only family member who refused to join in the search for Shannon. In fact, he went even more under the radar than he was before. People barely saw him outside his home following Shannon's disappearance. Someone else wanted him off the radar. That's right, Karen. When the investigation started, Karen was asked by the family liaisons to draw a complete family tree, and she did, leaving just one person out, Michael Donovan. 200 people had been interviewed by March 13th, 2008, Bar Michael. When they finally learned about this so far non-existent person, they looked at his record. Disturbingly, Michael had abducted his own daughter from school just over a year before the Shannon incident. Why had he done this? Well, Michael had two daughters, both in foster care, and he was not allowed to see either of them. Sometime before, he had forced both of them to watch him have intimate relations with an escort. Yeah. Michael Donovan was a monster. After the snatching, he was arrested, but quickly released again. However, with this information at hand and the fact that Karen had tried to hide his name, authorities went to his address and barged in. Initially, they found nothing. Michael was not at home and the house was quiet and empty. 
But the silence was suddenly broken by a faint voice coming from upstairs. Stop it, you are frightening me now. The officers followed the voice to a small room with two bunk beds. Underneath the bed was little Shannon, scared to death. She was rescued and one of the first responders commented, I just couldn't believe that we had not just found her, but found her alive. I got quite emotional. Michael was hiding inside his home. When an officer dragged him out, he bit him in an attempt to escape. While he was handcuffed, he shouted, get Karen down here now. We had a plan. And with this, he confirmed that Karen Matthews was guilty of kidnapping her own daughter. This is the reconstruction done by authorities to explain how Shannon was kept for almost a month. A bed with a rope tied around it kept her in place for most of the day. When she was allowed to leave the bed, there was a strict set of rules Michael had written for her. The rope of the bed allowed her to go to the toilet without asking for permission, but that was as far as it stretched. It was basically a leash. When Michael was booked into jail, this is all he had to say. Yes, you want arrest Karen. During his interrogation, Michael said everything was orchestrated by Karen. She would act as the distraught mother while he kept Shannon at his place and went off the radar. They would keep Shannon for as long as they needed to get the reward money. Remember that fund people set? It ended at 50,000 pounds, and this sum made Karen happy. She figured she could get her hands on it somehow and promised to split it 50-50 with Michael. Michael also wrote in his statement that Karen threatened to put three guys on him if he didn't comply with her plan. And I was frightened that if I didn't do it, they would come after me. The report gets even worse. Apparently Karen also dropped her daughter before tying her to Michael's makeshift bed, making sure she wouldn't fight back. And for two years before the kidnapping, Shannon was drugged with sleep-inducing pills by her mother. During Karen's trial, a forensic toxologist said Shannon's hair samples showed that she had regular doses of the potent hypnotic drug Temzepam in the months before she vanished. Karen was not very bright. How did she imagine that several weeks or months into the search, a member of her family would miraculously find Shannon and take the reward money? Michael was charged with kidnapping, false imprisonment, and perverting the course of justice. When Karen was arrested and received the same charges, she denied it all. Sure. Craig Meehan was also arrested on April 3rd. After his home and computer were searched, his charges were not those you would expect. 11 counts of pedophilia. Craig had photos of four-year-olds on his phone. Sheesh. He was sentenced to a mere 20 weeks in prison. On her second interrogation in jail, Karen confessed to giving her daughter to Michael, but denied her plan. She said she only gave her daughter to Michael to look after her, and she didn't know he would kidnap her. Then why did she ring authorities and cause a month-long ruckus that cost the government 3.5 million pounds? In court, Karen cried but she didn't have any other counter arguments. On December 4th, she and Michael were found guilty of all charges and sentenced to eight years in prison each. They were released after just four years. Not only did Karen not show any remorse for drinking or kidnapping her daughter, but she went on TV and complained about journalists ruining her image. None of it's true. I'm not Britain's worst mum. I didn't kill anyone. I'm scared I'll die, lonely and alone. The fact that she still paints herself as the victim in this story only goes to show how narcissistic tendencies and perhaps even psychopathy. To have this little empathy for your children is hard to imagine. Clearly Karen was never meant to be a mother. And yet she had seven children, five of whom endured unspeakable incidents, scarring them for life. And the worst experience was suffered by little Shannon. She is 25 years old now, but it's safe to assume she will never fully recover from what she went through in 2008. It's hard to move on past any traumatic kidnapping, let alone one your own mom orchestrated. With Karen out and about, let's just hope her children are as far away from her as possible. Unfortunately, she doesn't sound like a changed person. Hey, thanks for watching. What do you think about this tragic case? Do you know similar stories? Let me know in a comment and before you leave, make sure you like and subscribe. See you next time.